name is Yobi Benjamin. I'm Chief Operating Officer and Chief Software Officer of Avigan. I'm Ed Tang, the CEO and co-founder of Avigan. Could you um, start by telling us uh, a little about Avigan's history, how it came to be? Um, um, sure, history. yeah, this whole story kind of started out as a military project. Uh, my co-founder, uh, Alan Evans, was the original inventor of this technology, and he was working for a government lab. In that time, the military approached him and said, we have this major problem we have to displays. We've seen all the head-mounted displays out there. We've seen all these LCD and OLED panels, and nothing's working for us for a lot of our applications. We need a display that people can use that has really high fidelity, has great 3D, and doesn't give people eye strain, something people can view for hours at a time uh, for four to eight hour shifts and feel great. Uh, so you announced the Glyph recently. Um, can you give me a quick rundown of what it is and what makes it so special? Yeah, absolutely. The core technology about the Glyph is what makes this so special. So at Avagon, you guys know, we created what's called a virtual retinal display. And what's different about a virtual retinal display is that there's no screen. The image you see is projected directly into your eye. And the reason why we do that is we're trying our hardest to mimic your natural vision. Everything we see, all the light that enters our eye naturally, is we're used to seeing reflected light from other sources. So when I see your face, it's the image that's coming to me from you is a light that's bouncing off you from a lamp or from a sun. Uh, it's this reflected source. And so that's why things look so much more real and comfortable and, and, and vivid compared to staring at an LCD panel. So what we've, done, what we've done with the Glyph is taken, at this point, what was a technology demonstration of a new display technology and try to productize it, try to come up with a product to, to integrate our uh, virtual retinal display in a way that consumers will find it easy to use, uh, plug and play that works great with all the content they have today and all the, the uh, devices they own or they already own. So, I mean, you, you talk about productization. I mean, can you give us a brief overview of the design brief? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so uh, less than a year ago, this prototype of virtual retinal say was like the size of this desk. It, it, I mean, it looked like you went to a doctor's office and put your eyes into a machine. Um, and about four months after that, you have what Yobi's holding in his hand. This is an engineering prototype that you guys uh, were able to review several months back at Engadget Expand. Um, this is just a technology a technology demonstration. It's not by any means as a product, but we were able to show that we could get a virtual retinal display from something the size of a table, packaged into something the size that you could actually put on your face, almost like a pair of glasses. And I want to point out a couple of things here, which is also evident. About half of the people in the world wear corrective lenses. And uh, as you guys know, we have put this notion of diopters over here that allow people with uh, poor vision to actually use the glyph without their glasses. Second, we've also integrated uh, a, a, a uh, mechanism over here that actually does interpupillary distance, meaning the distance between your eyes. So we're, this device allows you to go and customize your visual uh, profile and lock it down for your use. That has found its way over into our alpha product, which just came out. So when we started looking at this engineering prototype and moving it into a, an actual product prototype, um, we started looking at a lot of different factors, which is what's going on in the head mounted display market today? What, what are consumers looking for? How do they want to use it? And what's stopping them from really picking up a, a product like this? So we started showing this prototype, this other prototype, to a lot of people. And people really appreciated the stunning visual quality. But what we quickly found is that when you're watching movies or playing your video games, that audio is such a huge part of the experience. And so we looked at a lot of other competing products out there, and very few things had audio. It was always some sort of strap-mounted, uh, head-mounted display, or, or video glasses. And it, it always had, what we saw, it always had a control box that was tethered to it. So that's the first thing that's got to go. Sure. No control box. And then for portable applications, you had external battery. That was tethered to it. Like, no, we don't want that. It's that's all built inside. So and then, and then the last part is audio. So what you'll see is that what we did was we wanted to make the product seem like something people would wear on an everyday basis. And as you can see, it does look like an oversized set of headphones, but it is not something that's strange to look at sure. in, in the sense of like people trying to go and figure out. What is that thing and is he carrying? The, the ground uh, 
the road forward was actually paved by many companies, such as Beats by Dre, for example, who's who pioneered very, very large headphones in different colors. So, so we look at all these head-mounted display wares, and they've got these displays, and they have these oversized headphones because they need that, that high-quality audio. And they have this just mess of cables. You have three, four, maybe sometimes even five cables to get it to be a porta portable uh, get-up where you can go. And we said that was a big problem. So our product that we're going to moving to in Kickstarter is going to be much slimmer, much sleeker, much lighter than this one. It'll be a single cable plugged into any device you want to your cell phone, your smartphone, your tablet, your computer, your console. Um, and uh, it'll be a, a great convergence device that you can use both as a headphone replacement and when you want video, you simply just move the video down. I mean, you, you talk about the uh, using it with mobile devices. Obviously, you have um, accelerometers built into the unit themselves. We do. Uh, you have, I think, I believe you said it was Bluetooth 4 enabled as well, which means it can tether to another device. Uh, do you see it uh, do you see that as a as a, as a strong element of the of the, of the lineup of, of the glyph in that it can uh, it can be a gaming device as well, or do you see it more as a sort of a marginal uh, element? Of it? I think it's absolutely critical. There's two goals that that we have going to this Kickstarter. One is we want to give consumers a product that they can enjoy immediately. It works great with everything they own right now, all their devices, all their content, and it's an amazing experience. But two, we want to give developers a path to create exciting new types of content, especially for the mobile platform. We want to give developers this wireless, low latency Bluetooth head tracker that now you can, use, you can use head tracking on your smartphone. And think of all the different applications now that you can use with your smartphone when you have head tracking. And it's a great new gaming experience. Um, but even now, it works great with the games you have on your phone. And uh, you know, we're gonna, we can show you some fantastic gaming experiences even on your cell phone right now. Sure. Um, we talked about the, the virtual retina display and roughly what it is. So you guys are, as I understand it, are using a, a brand new um, version of um, a Texas Instruments uh, chip, uh, which is in and I believe you're the first guys to use this in any device anywhere, is that right? It's absolutely right. So the, the benefits of this new uh, version, which is, I guess, loosely related, or, or related to the DLP technology from, from your, um, can you walk us through the, the benefits, the improvements between what we know of as DLP in the past and, and what we can see now? The main difference in what TI has done, and working, we're working very closely with them on this, is they've been able to fundamentally change their pixel structure. This is the first time in about 30 years that TI has made a fundamental change in their pixels. They're changing the way the pixels are moving. So instead of just tilting back and forth, they're now tilting and rolling in a very interesting pattern. And by doing that, they're able to increase their pixel density. So now we have an imaging micro mirror chip that is a lot smaller that could cram a lot more mirrors in the same space, same space. Much higher fidelity also, because as you can imagine, when a mirror just simply tilts back and forth versus rolling, it gives you a lot of subtleties mm -hmm. that you don't achieve by a simple tilt structure. So, um, so what that's allowed us to do is to give you this amazing visual quality, but at the same time reduce the power, reduce the cost for, for our product. And I think that's a huge win for the consumer market. I mean, I, I tried the uh, the unit uh, earlier, and it was um, it, it has an immediate wow factor to it. Yeah. What would you say? Do you, you've obviously had a lot of people try the unit out. Yeah. What would what was what would be your favorite uh, reaction that you've had so far? It's everyone who picks out something really different, and I find that really interesting. I've done probably over a thousand demos at this point. Some people talk about how amazing the resolution is. Some people talk about how real the image looks, or how amazing the color is. Um, one particular instance that really stood out at me is. I was doing a demo for a reporter in New York, and he was looking at one of our old prototypes. And he put it on, and he said, wow, look at these colors. And I said, yeah, that's great. No, I'm a little bit jaded, because I've seen this all the time, right? And I'm like, yeah, the colors are great. They're amazing. A lot of people say that. He's like, no, you don't understand. I'm colorblind. I'm seeing colors here I've never seen before. And that really made an impression on me. And then he kept on saying, I was there in that same thing, is that blue? <laughs> is, is that ocean you blue? blue? Yeah. You know how yeah. is, is that? Is that is that a green? And we, yes, that's a green. And we're trying. And it was really what Im impressed upon Ed, myself, and everybody on the team is that the possibilities for this technology is goes way further than simply a device that you can use to display content. There are there are other potentials we haven't fully explored. Um, given that we're focused on what we're doing right now, but these areas of exploration could be very profound in their, in their impact. I, I can say one thing is, is we're seeing things happen in the optical space 
that people don't understand yet. And it's very, very interesting qualities of this, of this display, performance of this, this display that, that some of the top optics guys in the world don't understand yet. And so we're entering this really exciting space of projecting on the retina. And, and um, it's, there's going to be, I think, a lot of interesting qualities coming out of it down the road. For now, though, it's an amazing experience that you can have right now. So um, at the moment, you guys have got a 45-degree a, a FOV uh, on the unit, um, which gives you, I think, a, a, an approximation of an 18-inch, between 70 and 18-inch screen in front of your face. Is that about right? Well, from about 8 feet away. Yeah, about 8 feet away. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I love that you, term too. Yeah, so give me. So, give, Sony's like, we have a screen that's 750 inches. What does that mean? <laughs> given the uh, given the quality of the image, uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of interest in the, in the virtual reality uh, sector. Yeah. Saying, guys, can we can we have a virtual reality headset? With this? Is that something you would consider? I, I realize what you're focused on, right? Is it something you would consider in the future? We um, absolutely would. I mean, my co-founder Alan always talks about how he's. A true and true VR enthusiast. I mean, he always talks about how he went down to Disney and saw this Aladdin VR for the first oh, time, okay. and and it really changed the course of you know where his career went. So he's a huge VR fan. We, we're huge VR fans. We love what's happening in the VR market today. That VR is getting really popular again, and that the consumers are getting really excited about it. I I think that we're absolutely interested in increasing the field of view. We think VR is a great space. We're keeping a very close eye on it to see where it's going to go. But what we want to give consumers today is something that they can enjoy right now. And so one of the things that we're worried about is we don't want to give consumers a product that they can't enjoy today. If they have to wait for some sort of content or for a big software developer to write an amazing game for it, is we want people to really enjoy their experience they have now. And, and you can see that even with content you have today, whether or not it's a movie or a game on your cell phone or it's, or it's music, they're great experiences you can have right now. And once we build up our user base and, and build up our, you know, continue developing our technology, we're absolutely interested in increasing the field of view yeah. and, and looking and, at other spaces. And we're absolutely confident in our software capabilities and our hardware capabilities to actually immediately pivot if we have to. Mm -hmm. It just really boils down to a business decision. How many people are actually going to use this? Um, th there is no technical challenge for us to pivot to a fully immersive, to a fully immersive environment. Mm -hmm. It's more of a market challenge than anything what, else. One of the things I think I, I wish would happen in the VR market, and maybe it will as it matures, is that more standards start to appear. And it's not like one company designs you know, one head tracker and one distortion field, and then another company does another one. And software developers are, are kind of on the hook on trying to develop for small... One SDK, you, one other SDK. Yeah, small, you know, a few thousand users here and a few tens of thousand users here. It would be great if, if the community could come together and start defining some, some industry-wide standards. I think that would be great for, yeah. for everybody. So it's a mobile uh, unit, obviously. Um, what is your target sort of uh, battery life um, in, I guess, AV mode would be the most power training? And right, what kind exactly. Of life are we, yeah, how, how many hours are we looking at? So in video mode, we're talking at least three hours of video, continuous video. And so that'll allow people to, to watch any kind of full-length feature film or to sit down and play a couple of hours of gaming on your phone. And so we have a built-in battery in this, so it will run on its own, on its own power. Plug it into your phone. It won't drain your phone at all. And uh, you can enjoy a couple hours of multimedia or, or game. You guys are heading into a Kickstarter, January 22nd, I believe. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, have you decided on reward tiers um, and pricing structure, that sort of thing? Uh, we haven't published anything yet as far as reward tiers. We're, we're carefully thinking about you know, where we're going to set these and kind of stretch goals and things like that. So definitely something to look forward to. So on January 22nd, we're going to be launching our Kickstarter for the new Alpha, uh, the new Avagant Glyph. Uh, it's going to be quite a bit different than what you're seeing here. This is just an early prototype of the new product concept that we have. Uh, this one shows the integrated audio and the flip up, flip down video. Uh, but we still believe that this, even though this is, it, it looks pretty polished, that it's still too big, too heavy, and there's a lot of improvements we can make for fit and adjustments. And we're working very hard on those right now. But to, in order to make this product real, in order to bring virtual retinal display to the market, we absolutely need the, our supporters. We need the supporters of Kickstarters to make this real. How long do you think after the, uh, the Kickstarter is finalized, do you think you can have units in people's hands? Our Kickstarter uh, supporters will see their units by fall. So they will see their very first units coming out. And uh, if they get on Kickstarter and order, they'll have the privilege of getting the units months before anybody else. Cool. So what's next for you guys uh, at uh, CES this year? It's, it's giving people 
as much eyes on hands on experience as they can. It's it's one thing to to talk about how the technology works and for people to write about it, people to read about it, but truly until you see it for yourself, you you won't understand that it's a very different experience. Great. Well, thanks uh, for your time, guys. Uh, best of luck with the Kickstarter. Best of luck with the rest of the CES. Thank you very much yeah. for your uh, for your coverage. We appreciate it. Wonderful.